guest host, Jess George. Our usual host, Matt Olin, is in Philly this week with one of our co-organizers, Tim Miner. They are attending the Knight Foundation Summit as winners of the Knight Cities Challenge Grant, which they won for their brilliant idea for the Queen City Quiz Show, which you will all get to experience later this morning. Now, if Matt and Tim can't come to Creative Mornings, Creative Mornings will come to Matt and Tim, or through the magic of Google Hangouts, no one will go anywhere, but we will still talk and see each other. So let's see if we can connect to them. Hey! Hey! Hey, I gotta tell you, thank you for, for the hookup on the Google Fiber, uh, Jess. This yeah, is no problem. clear as a bell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is advertised. Thank you, Google Fiber. 21st century technology infrastructure upgrade. <laughs> yep, absolutely, no problem. How are y'all doing? Well, we are having a great time up here in Philly workshopping our idea, Queen City Quiz Show, with um, 36 other finalists at the Night City Challenge uh, event, and it's, it's amazing. Lots of great ideas. Really proud. There are two other teams from Charlotte uh, that are, are doing the Queen City. Very, very proud. Nice. Yeah, and we just wanted literally just to drop in and say, we miss you guys. Uh, we hope you have an amazing morning. And Charlotte Luminary Cameo Alert, Charles Thomas. Oh! Charles Oh yeah, hello everybody, how are you doing? Here's that speaker, Charles. Have a great time. And by Thank the you. way, Jess, you are gonna rock it, but I just I, I wanted to tell you one more thing. Yeah. Whatever you do, mm -hmm. do not hurt it. Mm -hmm. Oh <laughs> so one of our very, very favorite traditions here at Creative Morning Charlotte is to bring a local musician. And this is to me one of the most magical moments because we had to highlight local talent. Let's welcome Skylar Chase. What? Check. It's okay to vibe out, everyone. Just, you know, kind of rock to it, you know. Yeah. People tell me switch the style up and watch the money pile up. I said forget it cause I know who I am And in this world you gotta know where you stand Plus wealth never determined the man So here I am, the black sheep You probably see me on your back streets The same corners where they clap heat They say we brothers but they not me I see the heavens in my arms reach Although we living in hell, the spirits would dwell I learned this at 12 When I told my brother bye As he waved to a cell to live dormant My dream's enormous To serve these rappers like a George Foreman The young omen, they put their hope in Your future's hopeless Deliver people like a Moses It's black roses for you freaking poses Today's a new day, so walk a new way Put down the oozes, go hug a fluze So, as I mentioned, this is an international phenomenon, Creative Morning Charlotte. Every single month we get together and we get to connect locally with each other. We get to collaborate with each other, we get to learn about each other, and it really is this local bonding experience. But this growing global phenomenon also gives us a chance to connect internationally. And so one of our new favorite traditions is that, if you remember last month, we sent a video message to Taipei, see where that is. And they sent us a message back. Should we watch it? Yes. Hey, Charles, have a great morning. OK, so now we get to do one of our own, if I can do this properly. All right. We are going to do, you know what? I was going to selfie it, but I'm not good at that, so let's do it this way. I mean, I'm great at it, by the way, but um, I would be in the way of everyone else. Okay, so we're going to do Shalom, Jerusalem. Have a creative morning. All right. I like to create it, iterating on each other. I like this. Shalom, Jerusalem. Have a creative morning. Oh, it's awesome. I love it. Do you know what time it is? It's time to win! I have chosen three random words from my last theory on Broken, which are creative, destruction, and the 80s. And we have created a theme we are calling Queen City MacGyver. 
Your task is to, in 90 seconds, get the stuff open. You're going to need it open. You have 90 seconds to take these destroyed items, and should you fix them, nay, you should make something new and better and different and name it. <laughs> Wow, 90 seconds, that's up quickly. All right, what have you created here? This is a digital bikini. Oh, that's, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. A digital bikini. So we decided we needed that, the PB Herman twin travel finder so we wouldn't get separated anymore. Oh. It works like that. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> oh, that's really, really sweet. Well, Sarah, I'm glad we got, we, we would never be lost we'll again. Lost. Yeah. And, and what did you create? We created a modern uh, gum dispenser. <gasps> A gum dis so where's the gum? It's right there. And and so how does it work? You when you want some gum, you take it. You take it off. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's a little bit analog. Monty pursued his design career in part because he loved buildings with his father, an engineer, and then he studied art and initially thought he would become a sculptor. His work at the Bolt Group, which he co-founded over 30 years ago, combines his passions for product innovation, art, design, engineering. He leads multidisciplinary teams in product innovation, marketing, user research, industrial design, user experience design, ergonomics, engineering, which is a fancy way of saying he has maybe the coolest job of anyone I have ever heard of. Um, his companies do something amazing. They help companies create profitable new products. He's listed on over 30 patents, which is badass. Here to speak to us on our global theme of broken, please welcome Monty Montague. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Boy, this is going to be great. This is going to be so good. At least I think it is. So, but I have to admit that when Matt Olin asked me to be a speaker at Creative Warnings and he said the theme is broken, I said, Matt, I don't know about that. That's, that's not me. But I, I hope that at the end of this presentation you'll see that it, <clears throat> that it is apropos. So what is broken? Broken to me is a gap or a mess or something that's just not working right. So a gap, as in a, a broken line or a broken promise, or a, broken, a mess, as in a broken glass or a broken home, or something that's just not working right, like a broken record or a broken heart. So I'm a designer, and more specifically, I'm a product designer. And more specific than that, I'm an industrial designer, which is the name that the product design profession gave itself back in the 20s, and unfortunately, we stuck with it. Because when I tell people I'm an industrial designer, they think, oh, you must be designing plant layouts and sprinkler systems and industrial equipment. And I say, no, it's, 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 it's not really that. What we do is we design products, and we make them look better and work better and feel better, stuff like this. And some designers you've probably heard of uh, Raymond Lowy, the guy up in the upper left, Charles Eames, the guy down in the middle at the bottom, Johnny Ive is the guy that has made Apple design famous. So I've been a practicing industrial designer, product designer, and design <laughs> thinker in Charlotte for over 30 years. That's me with the really bad mustache there in the middle. <laughs> and uh, my firm is called Bolt Group. I was one of the founders of the firm. And I've got a secret to tell. I'm going to share it with this group, but please don't tell my clients. So here's my secret. I don't really like products. I don't like products. I'm not much of a consumer. I don't buy stuff. I don't go to the store. I'm not a car guy. I, my, my wife buys my clothes. I don't get my hair done at the salon. I mean, you know, it, it, when I go to the mall to shop, I spend my time looking at the display fixtures and the architecture and the design of those more than the products themselves. So why am I a product designer? Well, I'll give you a few reasons. One is I'm a fixer. I like to smooth out the gaps and take care of the messes and make things work right and look right. And secondly, I'm a maker. I like to make stuff. I'm a sculptor. I like to make objects. And I like to make things that look novel and that look like they have a story. I like to imbue a story into things that I make. And then I, from the early age, I knew how to see. I knew how to focus in on something. And, and because I knew how to see, I knew how to draw, because those are so tied together. 
So let's break those down a little bit. How do you tell a story with product design? So first, the designer has to imbue the product with his or her point of view. You have to have a point of view. And then secondly, you recognize that people are reading the product. The user is really a reader of the form. And then you, you understand that in the product design world, things are designed for specific audiences. And so we build these emotional triggers into the form, into the design of the product to connect with the people, that specific audience. It's a little bit like advertising. It's kind of a dirty secret of the product design world, but we're building these emotional triggers for a specific, specific audience within the product. You can kind of see it in sculpture. You kind of, kind of look at a sculpture like one of my pieces here. You can kind of imagine that face with the blindfold on it. There's a story there. Well, product design's the same way. So next, how do designers fix things? Well, designers of all stripes, product and otherwise, are taught to reimagine things. One of the famous industrial designers that I mentioned, one of the founders of the profession, Raymond Lowy, wrote an autobiography. And his autobiography is called Never Leave Well Enough Alone. Never Leave Well Enough Alone. It's sort of the antithesis of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So once we realize that we all live in sort of a separate reality, that each reality is different from the next, and that, that everything we see, we're constructing in our heads. It's really just photons entering the eyes, but it's all really in here. And what's in here is different from me than it is from you. Then we know that reality is the enemy of innovation. And we're an innovation firm. So we know that nothing is set in stone. Everything can be rethought, redesigned, made better, made different. And the great thing about being a product designer is you can come up with those ideas, but then we have the technology to make it happen. We can build prototypes, and we can figure out how to engineer it, and we can get it into production. So it's really a, it is a cool profession. Now, sometimes we're focused on the little things, the little annoyances of life, the everyday products. How many people have been to a, a hotel, and you couldn't figure out how to dial in the hot water on the shower <laughs> or to make the plunger go in the tub? It's horribly annoying. Why does that happen? Well, that's bad product design. If you've ever had that happen, Read this book. It'll, it'll piss you off in a really good way. <laughs> it's, it's a great book. So, but now with design thinking, designers are expanding the scope of design beyond just the mundane little annoyances. <clears throat> so it's, it's what I call scope creep with intention. So industrial design is, is oh, excuse me, design thinking is industrial design on what used to be considered non-design problems. So you've heard of the term design thinking. Well, it's taking the industrial design process of gaining user empathy and then coming up with a lot of creative ideas and then making a lot of mock-ups and then testing those with people and failing and going back and making up another mock-up, testing with people failing again, going back and making another mock-up, testing and then finally coming up with something that works. And that's being applied to big problems now. So, so the question is, what is a design-sized problem? What is a creative design-sized problem? How, What's our lane? Well, maybe they're small things. Maybe it's just coming up with a way to hold the ketchup bottle to get that last little drop out because I'm too lazy to hold it up myself. That thing in the middle. Or maybe it's coming up with new materials, indigenous materials, to design a product that already exists, like my friends here with the uh, mud pool table. Or maybe it's the old mashup. We do that a lot in our office. So that the, the sketch on the left is from my, my wife's sixth grade school class. She asked her students to draw a picture of what innovation was to them, an, an example of innovation. <laughs> you know? It doesn't get any better than that, right? Tricks and Fruit Loops in the same box. <laughs> and, and, and that's often what we do when we're developing a new product. We take two existing things and we mash them together and it becomes a third. But what about a bigger scale? What about making libraries relevant in the digital world. Brick and mortar libraries, how do they become relevant in the digital world? Is that a design size problem? Or providing clean water to people in sub-Saharan Africa, is that a design sized problem? Or coming up with a system in Charlotte that inspires people to ride bikes more often than taking a car, is that a design size problem? So now that we think about reimagining things on lots of scales, little scales, mundane annoyances, 
big scales, giant, wicked problems. How do we find what's broken? How do we find the problems? Well, I'm going to dig a little deeper into some of the tactics that we use at, at my office, Bolt Group. There's a se several strategies we use to gain empathy with the user and to find what's broken. And the first three in this list are the, probably the most important. Watching, which is observation, asking, which is interview, and doing, which is role playing. So we'll break this down a little bit. Designers have become suburban anthropologists. We go into people's houses, we go into their places of work, we go into construction sites where they're working, and we, we don't wear lab coats, but we, we, we watch them, we observe, we have a keen focus, we videotape, and we learn how they interact with their environment and their products to make things better, to reimagine those products. And the focus is key, <clears throat> the observation is key. One of my earliest memories in life was at a funeral, and it was the funeral of my baby brother. He was stillborn. Um, it's a tragedy for my parents. I was three and a half, maybe four, so I didn't really get what was going on at all. But I remember sitting at the, actually the outside graveside service, nice sunny day, row of chairs, and there's this white box. And I'll never forget this little white box. And not only can I remember the white box, I can remember the OG cornicing on the white box and the, the finish, the white finish on the box and the velvet fabric that was covering the pedestal that the little white box was sitting on. And I'm sitting there looking at, what, why are we staring at this white box? I don't know why we're here. And the other memory is, to my left was my grandmother, and I looked at her and I noticed that a tear <clears throat> rolled out of her eye. And it rolled down and landed on her black wool jacket. And I'm wondering, why is grandmother crying? But, but more than that, I'm wondering, wow, look at that tear, because it stood up and the surface tension made it just sit there. And I'm going, <laughs> My God, it's not soaking into the jacket. That's amazing. And I, I can remember to this day looking at it, and I could see in that tear the reflection of the other people sitting in the, the arc of chairs that were looking at the white box. And I'm thinking, this is so cool. There's reflection in there, and it's not soaking into her material, which I'd never seen at three and a half happened. And there's a white box, and everybody's looking at it, and I see the reflection. And I remember that to this day. And so you use those little observations. If you, learn, if you train your eye to see, and you remember that, you use those in your work. Well, we don't have to remember because we videotape everything. <laughs> We've got gigabytes and gigabytes of videotape that we then have to go through and find the key, uh, the key items from. But for example, for Rubbermaid, they hired us to help them redesign the flat iron that people use to, to, to straighten their hair. Hard to use, you have to reach behind your back. So we videotaped people in their bathrooms using that to understand how to make it better. And then role playing, we, whether it's a medical doctor or someone that takes care of golf greens for a living. We get in there and do what they do so we can have empathy with their needs. Now, what are some strategies that we use? I'm going to lift a, list a few specific strategies that we do to find what's broken, to find what's broken that we can then innovate around. One is we look for duct tape. We do a lot of work with designing tools, tools for DIYers around their home, tools for contractors that are building a home. And so we do a lot of research in construction sites. And one of the things, for example, that we noticed was this. Very hot in a construction site. No good way to keep it cool. Fans are held together with duct tape. Hey, duct tape. So for Hunter Fan, we developed this fan. Blows a lot of air, very rugged. You can pick it up easily, throw it in the pickup truck. Has an outlet to put your power tools in. And it looks cool. So we watch outliers. A lot of times research is focused on the 80%. But if you look at the outliers, if you look at the people that are on the fringes, sometimes the early adopters, the outliers, that's where you look for and find real innovation opportunities. <coughs> we work for a company that makes traction devices that you put on your shoe to walk in the ice and snow. We went to Minneapolis and Colorado and other places and videotaped and interviewed people slipping around on the ice and snow to get a sense of what that meant. And then also we learned that there are runners, people that jog and run, and they run every day regardless of the weather. So if you live in the Northeast, I didn't know this, I live in the Southeast, but if you're a jogger, you're going to go out and run in the ice and snow almost regardless of the weather. <clears throat> and there was no product for those people. So for those people, we came up with the Yak Tracks Run, and it's one of their best selling products now. Uncover gaps. So a lot of times we're looking for what's broken between what exists today. So the gaps, the white space between existing products, 
For example, uh, for Applica Black & Decker, which is the company that makes all the Black & Decker brand kitchen appliances, they wanted us to explore filtered water. So we did a gap analysis of what are the gaps between your different products that exist today. And we did a similar thing for diabetes. We have family members who have diabetes, and di products that measure glucose are hard to use, they're hard to read, they don't provide enough information, and they're ugly. So we wanted to come up with something that was stylish, that a young person would, like to, would really like to use, like to wear, easy to use, easy to read, provides trend data in addition to the exact um, glucose reading at that moment. And we, we call it sugar. And hopefully this will come to market right now as a concept. Find the marginalized. So if you look for people that are marginalized, it's, a, it's an opportunity for innovation because that's broken. So we're doing now a program with one of the largest manufacturers of playground equipment, where we're designing a series of outdoor playground equipment for parks and schools for what's called inclusive play, meaning pulling in children with disabilities or differently abled people of all stripes so that they can be integrated into the playground and not have to sit marginalized on the side. It reminds me of all of us having different abilities and disabilities, like eyeglasses. Eyeglasses are one of the disability aids that most people in this room will use at some point in their life. And at one time, they were medically required necessities. And then someone reimagined them, and now they're fashion statements. And I'll tell you another one that I think of as a disability aid or an ability aid. It's this guy right here. And you know, because without this thing, I can't hear people talking on the other side of town or the other side of the world. Right? I can't hear them without this. And if I can't hear people talking across town or across the world, then I'm not able to do my job. I'm disabled. So this is a, an ability aid or takes care of my disability of being able to hear across town. <laughs> and then lastly, from that we imagine the future. With a lot of clients, what we're doing is we're working with him to look at three years out, five years out, eight years out, ten years out sometimes. And for example, we worked with Herman Miller, the storied office furniture company, for about nine years, and then with Allsteel, another office furniture company, looking at what's in the office workplace and how do we manage that continuum between concentration and collaboration that we all fall in at different points in time in the office, and how do we do that with different kinds of furniture. And then right here in Charlotte, we're helping to reimagine the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. Again. Libraries are suffering now in the digital space. And one thing that we've done with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Lobby is we helped create a maker space, a place that has 3D printers and laser cutters. And, and so the library now is a place you can go get information, take that information, develop an idea, come back to the library, and make that idea in a maker space. So it's kind of reinventing, reimagining what a library is. So let's, let's bring this back home. What's broken in Charlotte? Well, the list is really long, but I'm going to name three things and then wrap up. So the first thing is we need a better mobilization of our collective creative capital. Pre presentations like this are wonderful. Creative mornings, we've got TEDx, we've got Pecha Kucha nights. Presenters go, people get inspired, then they go back to their individual spaces, do their individual work. And there's not this wrapping of our arms around the entire creative community to mobilize for the greater good. And we've got a huge one here in Charlotte. I mean, when you think of the chefs and the photographers and the dancers and the writers and the artists and the farmers and the designers and the engineers and the architects and all the others, we've got this great mass of creative talent and brain trust. But how do you mobilize that? Why can't the AIGA and the AIA and the IDSA and all of them you know, have a design week one week and for a week collect some money, do something cool, and then use that as a springboard to mobilize for the greater good, to, to accomplish maybe some of these next things, to take care of some of these next broken issues that I'm passionate about. So this is the next broken issue in Charlotte, and that is we need to work quickly to protect our precious bohemias in town. There are a few little precious business trips that we have left over in Charlotte that exude with character the Notas and the Plaza Midwoods and maybe four or five others that you can name. And they're endangered species. 
they're endangered species because there's nothing right now, nothing at all, to keep this from looking like this. Amen. And that, <laughs> and that is a design problem. I mean, look at that. Whew. That's a design problem. So, so is that a design size problem, though? I think so. I think so. And then pulling in our marginalized. So I go this way to work every day, and I drive by this location on the street, and typically there's a homeless person or two with a cardboard card there, and I kind of avert my eyes when I pull up before I take the left there and try not to look at them um, like everybody else. And I said, you know what, I need to use my suburban anthropology skills and dig a little deeper into this and figure out what's going on. And so one day I parked at the parking garage across the street and I walked over to this, this sidewalk and there wasn't anybody at the time there. And so I just stood there as the cars pulled up to the stoplight and waited and then left and pulled up and waited and left. And I just stood there and I kind of looked about like I did do now, and I guess I look. I guess I look like a homeless person because they were not looking at me. In fact, as I walked down the sidewalk towards the car at the end of the row, a young woman in the car literally put it in reverse and backed up to get away from me as I was walking down the sidewalk. Ooh. So I stood there for a while, and finally Randy showed up. Randy moved to Charlotte a few weeks ago from Indiana to take a job. He lost his job mainly because he was drinking too much. He admitted. And now he's homeless, has no money, and so he's standing on the corner. And he said, you know, and I asked him, well, have you tried treatment? And I asked him a lot of questions. And he said, yeah, I've got a drinking problem and I just can't fix it. I just can't fix it. I started thinking, hmm, can't fix it. Can't fix it. Well, so, so, home, so, so, so I started to think, so alcoholism is a disability, really. And we know that homelessness is caused by disabilities, like alcoholism. And we know that disabilities can be resolved by design. So therefore, homelessness is a design size problem. Homelessness is a design size problem. And it's a, and it's a problem that if we create this collaborative mobilization of the creative community, we can chip away at it. And a lot of, other, the, a lot of the other things that are broken here in Charlotte. So, if it ain't broke, look again, and never leave well enough alone. Thank you. How do you bridge the gap between the economic demands of housing development and homelessness and creativity and fix those design size problems? <laughs> wow. Sorry. I don't know. Do you want me to go to the next question? <laughs> Good question. Well, sorry, it was good very question. broad, but you know, there's there's the economic demand, you know, for growth and uh, development, right. and like you said, it is a design size problem. So where's the bridge? Where do we build a bridge? Well, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer the question, other than it's getting worse because people like Randy are moving here because jobs are here. They come here and then they, for whatever reason, don't keep the job. So the problem's getting worse, and if you kind of extrapolate five years out, it's going to be significantly worse. So I don't know the answer, but I know that mobilizing more people is part of the solution. So I was watching this program on WTVI, which is my favorite station in the whole world. And um, they showed this um, sort of solution to what you guys were just addressing. And one solution that was created was a lady um, created a restaurant that's a co-op. And it's volunteer run, and it's in a very visible part of town and so homeless people and regular people interact all the time because they're eating together so it's 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 there are these big community tables where people sit and have lunch or have dinner together and you know you have to interact i mean you you can't avoid it and um anyway it's it's just a lovely idea for you know maybe randy could come cut my grass i don't know but i thought it was really cool well, and that's the thing, it's often it's little things, it's a creative idea that starts small and then it's extrapolated and, got, and you make it bigger. But sometimes it's just that creative idea, that nug of an idea that, that becomes something that's valuable. Um, I was wondering if you could give uh, any word of advice or any um, strategy 
for somebody who may have ideas um, but may not have the means to execute it. So, for example, the design week you said, you may have some, you may have somebody who's a college student or somebody who's a recent grad or somebody who may be um, just working an entry-level job. They may have the idea from that for that design week. How do they get into the room with the proper people who may be running AIGA or may be um, the head of some other design organization? How do we bridge those types of gaps? Because in my experience, I've found that it's often the people who have the ideas and the people who have the funding who aren't in the same room. There are a number of organizations that connect funding, venture capital, to people with the gut ideas. But right here in Charlotte, you've got a number of hacker spaces, maker spaces, the one that I just mentioned at the library, where if you have an idea, there are people there that can help you bring that idea to fruition, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of development of that idea. And, and that's what their business is like mine, that do that, do that as well. Thank you again, Monty. Everyone give Monty. Thank you. Thank you.